Okay, now let's talk about a couple other um, innovations that are upcoming. The first is a change to the cell technology itself. Okay, so previously I've said that a DRAM cell is implemented as one capacitor connected to ground. Okay, and you are storing data by, by, by either storing charge or not storing charge on this capacitor. Okay, so this is a charge-based technology. Now, the problem with these DRAM cells is that, you know, we kind of know how to scale for a couple more generations. We know how to make these capacitors smaller. But beyond that, there are no known good solutions. Okay, so we need to find a better way to implement each cell uh, within a very small area. Okay, so people are hence considering different alternative cells. So one alternative that has been considered is called a phase change memory cell. Okay, so this is a piece of material. Uh, if you heat up the material and then cool it, depending on your rate of, of heating and cooling, the eventual material is either amorphous or it is crystalline. Okay, if it is amorphous, it has high resistance. If it is crystalline, then it has low resistance. Okay, and so this is an alternative way to store state within these cells. Okay, so, uh, you know, if, if you have high resistance, then you're storing a 1. If you have low resistance, then you're perhaps storing a 0. Okay, and so if you want to measure what is being stored, you apply a voltage, and then you measure the current that goes through that piece of resistance. Okay, and, you know, this is supposed to have higher density because this material can be made much smaller than you can make one of these, these DRAM capacitors. Okay, so there are other advantages associated with this device as well. So, you know, as I said, it can be made much smaller. It can also store multiple bits of information. Okay, so, uh, you know, what I just described is if you're crystalline, you have low resistance. If you're amorphous, then you have high resistance. But based on your cooling rate, your material can have different levels of amorphousness as well. Okay, so... And so you can actually implement a cell that has a resistance that's somewhere over here or somewhere over here. Okay, so instead of just partitioning this into, you know, 0 or 1, where uh, the left-hand side is crystalline and the right-hand side is 1, you can also partition this resistance range into more states. Okay, so if, you, if your cell eventually has a resistance that falls in this range, then you're storing the information 0, 0. If you have a resistance that falls in this range, then you're storing the information 0, 1. Okay, if the, if the resistance falls here, then that's um, 1, 1. If resistance is in this range, then that's a 1, 0, right? So that, that single cell can be made to represent, you know, multiple bits of information. And this is why uh, this kind of storage is meant, is, is, uh, is slated to have very high density, especially in the future when DRAM cells are not going to be made um, as, as small. Okay, the other big advantage of using these devices is they are non-volatile. Okay, so even if you unplug the power to this device, those materials are going to continue to remain either amorphous or crystalline, right? So they don't lose state once you unplug power, which is not the case with DRAM, right? With DRAM, if you unplug power and you stop the refresh process, within a few milliseconds, all of your charge is going to leak away. Okay, so this is also non-volatile. And if you compare it with, with, with other non-volatile storages, such as flash or disk, you know, these PCM technologies are supposed to be, you know, much faster and much more energy efficient. Okay, and there are other such non-volatile technologies that are being considered as well, such as STT RAM. Okay, what are the main disadvantages of using something like PCM or STT RAM? So firstly, they have a much higher latency and energy penalty when performing writes. Okay, because the write involves this, this heating and melting process of the material. And so it takes a really long time to do it, and it also consumes a lot of energy. This write process is also problematic because, you know, as you heat and cool these devices, they ultimately break down. Okay, so for PCM, you can write to a device about 100 million times, and then after that, it is very, it, it is extremely likely that the device is going to stop working. Okay, so you can only write a limited number of times, and this is one of the main reasons why, you know, PCM is not expected to be a substitute to DRAM technology, right? So because DRAM is much more efficient in terms of latency, energy, and lifetime, uh, what we expect is that you'll have a processor which is connected to a whole bunch of DRAM memory and then if you have a miss in your memory then you go to something that uses PCM technology and then if you have a miss here then you go to either disk or flash. Okay, so this is how we expect our future memory hierarchies to evolve uh, and also employ these newer cells. Okay, one last technology I wanted, wanted to touch on is that of silicon photonics, right? So, you know, you have a processor 
you have a DIMM. Currently the connection is happening through these memory pins and these electrical wires on your on your motherboard. And we talked about how these pins are not expected to increase too much, right? And so because of that you have this this bandwidth problem. Okay, so some people have said that you know instead of using these electrical uh, pins and electrical wires, let's use silicon photonics. Okay, so you have a single silicon waveguide that goes from the processor to the memory chips. Okay, and you're carrying your data in the optical domain. Okay, so the silicon waveguide is carrying light, and you know depending on the amplitude of the light, you're either carrying a one or a zero. Okay, and you know this light can be made up of multiple wavelengths. And each wavelength can carry a different signal. Okay, so you know one of these silicon waveguides can carry about 64 different wavelengths. Okay, so you're having you know 64 bits of data transmission on a single waveguide. Okay, so you can add you, you can also have multiple waveguides coming out of a processor, and that gives you a much higher data bandwidth. Okay, and you know these these uh, these optical signals can also be modulated at a higher frequency. That is, you know, I can switch between a zero and a one at a very high frequency. So not only can I carry 64 bits of data at a time, you know, that data can be switching at a very high speed, which gives me, you know, extremely high bandwidth. Okay, there's also a slight power advantage with going to optics because you can travel very long distances, you know, without incurring a very high energy penalty. But you know this whole transmission between electrical and optical domains also requires circuits that consume a fair bit of power, right? And these are circuits that operate at very high frequencies. Okay, so you know if you really compare the power consumption of electrical versus optical, that difference is not very large. Okay, so the main reason why we will likely use optics in the near future is because of this this high bandwidth advantage. Okay, so in the next five years, it's possible that some high-end systems will use optics to communicate between the processor and the memory system. Okay, so that kind of ends my discussion of technology trends in the memory system. And uh, starting with the next video, we will turn our attention to multiprocessors and cache coherence.